Okay, good evening. It's really, really great pleasure and it's fantastic to be finally in front of live people and not in front of some black boxes on, on Zoom and other platforms. So I will try to be fast uh, today. Maybe it's going to be some kind of lo a roller coaster. Now I'm doing this same video as a whole semester. <laughs> Usually like three hours, sometimes like we squeeze into two, but I never did like 45 minutes or one hour. So it's going to be tough, but, but, but let's try. New extractivism. An assemblage of concepts and allegories. The word assemblage is usually understood as a collection or gathering of things or people, a machine or object made of pieces fitted together, or a work of art made by grouping together found or unrelated objects. This map and accompanying footnotes are precisely that. One big messy assemblage of different concepts and ideas, assembled into one semi-coherent picture or let us say a map, a world view. So this map basically it's completely different, not completely, but it's different than my previous maps. Usually I'm, I did some kind of big black maps trying to investigate different kinds of invisible infrastructures, trying to investigate AI or, or like some planetary scale systems or this invisible factory like Facebook factory or trying to, to find a way how to understand those complexities and those like uh, different layers hidden behind our screens. And, and this map and, and this visual essay, it's kind of side effect of that because in one moment I realized in, in the beginning I really believed in like, you know, you can do like some kind of technical investigation and then visualize data and then get something. And, but then after like few first drawing, I realized that, okay, I have a picture, but I don't understand what is the meaning of that. And then I turned into more into some kind of media theory and philosophy and trying to, to understand the meaning of, of those like images that I'm seeing, the meaning of those maps and what kind of power is hidden behind those systems. And, and, and so did this map, it's kind of side effect of that because I, I tried to when I was doing that, I, I really loved to, to visualize different uh, concepts and philosophical ideas or, or, or like media theory thingies and in, in some kind of visual form. So this craziness that you are going to see tonight, it's like some kind of mis mishmash of all of those things. It's some kind of assemblage of, of different concepts, different allegories. I know it's a bit, bit dense and, 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 and too much, but I will try to explain some of them, and, and maybe we will survive together this. 1. Gravity Like Einstein's theory of relativity, massive objects curve the space and time of the topography of the Internet, proportionally to their weight, defined by the number of their users and content. So we can think of massive monopolies and conglomerates such as Google and Facebook as enormous black holes that, with their gravity, create a field so intense that it attracts and swallows the content and users. So the, the first idea is this idea of gravity. So like, you know, thinking about internet as a, as a, as a space, it's, it's always kind of, kind of challenging, no? But then uh, I found out this idea about uh, gravity and an and idea that like, you know, like all of those big pla platforms that we use, they have a mass. And then we can think about that in some kind of uh, Einstein theory that how they basically like, like shape the time and space and how when we are browsing and using internet following from falling into one hole and another hole, feeling this kind of heavy weight of platforms. 2. Forces Many other potential vectors and social forces contribute to that gravitational force. The fear of social isolation, economic and professional insecurity, unrealistic expectations of efficiency and productivity in the adapt or die environment, tailored addictions, depression and anxieties. These are just some of the other vectors that constitute social forces that keep us, with or without our wish, attached to those platforms. The social cost of opting out has become so high that opting out is essentially a fantasy. 3. Black Holes Our imaginary hero is swimming against one of those platforms' gravitational force. As they glide towards the singularity defined by the mass of these giants, users and content pass beyond the event horizon, the imaginary boundary in time and space, beyond which there is no return to the outer part of this universe. 
The event horizon defines the line after which the social and economic price of leaving those platforms is becoming too high. No matter how fast they try to swim now, the stream will pull them towards the center of the black hole. Without even noticing, this story's actor is now falling towards the hole. <laughs> Dramatic pause. Huh? So it's not, it's not just about the mass, and, and it's not about, of course, number of users. We, then I was thinking, okay, what, what else? It, they, it must be some kind of like uh, different vectors. And, and, and then like we have uh, like different relations with those like uh, platforms. So sometimes it's like addiction, and some of them are like made to be addictive. Sometimes it's about like our insecurity. Sometimes it's about economic uh, aspects, you know, like if you want to, to, to find a new job, you need to have a really nice uh, profile on Facebook or LinkedIn and so on. So, so it's like several different factors that, that in a way constitute this gravity. And then I was thinking, okay, this gravity is sometimes too big, you know, so in a way try to imagine, you know, life without Google or without all of those like social media and stuff like this. So in a way, it's some kind of black holes. And then I really like this, this metaphor of, of like this point of no return and this moment in which this like social price that you need to pay to, 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 to get out of there, it's becoming too big. So what, what that means? It, it means like try to live without mobile phone, try to live without you know, Gmail or whatever, or maps. And, and it, it's, it's becoming harder and harder to, 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 you know, like stay out of that. And this is this like imaginary point of no return. If in the moment we, we are not, not even sensing the moment we are falling over this line and falling into the, into the next metaphor that is the cave. Hole into a new allegory, the cave. Four. Allegory of the Cave What takes place at the bottom of this metaphorical black hole can be described through Plato's Allegory of the Cave. Plato describes a group of people who spend their entire life chained to cave walls looking at a blank wall. These people are watching the shadows of real objects projected on this wall, giving them names and meanings. In our story, the script and directing of this performance of shadows are entrusted to human algorithmic machines that regulate, filter, censor and moderate the projected content on the walls of the cave. The existing elements and content that exist outside this cave and horizon of events create an information flow, a theater of shadows. Here the, the story starts to be really depressing, but <laughs> okay, you will get it. So. We are in the cave, you know, and then really, you know, this is probably the, the story about uh, Plato's allegory of the cave. It's the most used allegory probably ever. In the original st story, there is like, uh, you know, several people chained there. An interesting part of this story is that the, the images that are projected there on the wall of the cave are basically, you know, behind the cave you have a light, and then there are like other people who are outside of the cave making some kind of theater play with the with the puppets and then people inside of the cave they are kind of giving some kind of like meaning and, and different ontologies and different meanings to 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 those uh, pictures on on the wall and and here in this our allegory what is really interesting it's also what is going on who who are the people who are like making this uh, you know theater play and in a way this is something that we will discuss here as well but but you know like it's it's mostly this kind of like director of this reality show. It's, uh, it's uh, basically algorithms and different kinds of mathematical functions, di different kinds of AI, statistical functions, and so on. So, so uh, uh, basically they are directing this reality show that is like being screened uh, um, in front of our faces. Five. Walls. The cave and tower walls are constructed of multiple opaque layers and built mostly by ghost work or invisible labor. The bricks of this structure are made of black boxes, closed code and hardware, glued together with the invisible network infrastructure. They are covered with layers of corporate secrets, patents and copyrights. So 
the walls. Why we are not able to see outside of the wall? And I think I'm here really biased because I spent like five, six, seven, ten years, I don't know, in investigating those layers, those layers. And in, in this context, those layers are, are different kinds of materials or layers that, that are constituting this wall. So we can st start from our you know, devices that we are not, you know, it's not possible to open them anymore. You can go further and, you know, try to understand the networks behind it, try to understand, like, you know, those data centers, then if you, that are also barbed wire. <laughs> so it's kind of like uh, layers of layers of dif different untransparencies, but also within those, like, uh, 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 data centers, we have now completely some kind of crazy abstraction of different layers of algorithms, statistical AI, and you can, even deeper you go, it's, it's more cra crazy it is, you know, like you cannot penetrate inside of those like neural networks and try to understand what is behind them. So all of those layers are kind of constituting this wall and not allowing us to see the, the, the reality. What is also like really interesting in thinking about the, the cave, it's especially in this, these times of pandemic, we are completely into our caves. We spend like two years in our caves and the only window outside of this cave was like projection of, on the wall of our cave or projection on the screens of our mobile phones and, and, and computers. Six, the interface. Interfaces are framing and structuring the projected algorithmic spectacle of images. Even though they are a direct manifestation of rules, regulations and taxonomies, they successfully obscure what is hidden beneath them. They define directly or indirectly what we can or cannot do. They are both tools and discursive frames. They are instituted as an order of discourse and embodiment of the discipline power of the platform. This cave is not only a prison cell, but it carries out the function of a factory hall and a resource extraction apparatus. The prisoner performs their threefold function as a worker, a resource and a product. So interface is really, really important because like uh, 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 to understand that, that, you know, like they define exactly what we can do or cannot do in a sense of if it's a square Instagram just squares and all they, they influence what kind of pictures we are making they are influencing you know like uh, visually how the things look but they also uh, uh, define the rules of the game if the rules of the game it's to ha to have more hearts with a bigger number or whatever this like reputation economy or whatever it's completely defined by the interface so in in that sense the interface is something that we need to obey the interface it's also hiding like also what is happening behind but interface it's also our office space you know like it also defining what we will produce what kind of file how long the tweet can be how long you know what is the size of the picture can we insert hyperlink or not so it, it's kind of really uh, 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 um, really powerful way of, of control and and this triangle beneath this cave it's something that I mean in anatomy of an AI system and, and also before this triangle have a main a meaning to me because like it's always like I was mostly into investigating factories, you know, invisible factories. And if you think about the process of production, the usual thing, what you, you know, you start from Marx and, and so on. And, and then, you know, it's always this relation between resource, labor and the product. And, and in this new space that is also like a cave prison and 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 the working space we perform the all three uh, uh, sides of this triangle so we are being a resource from where the the data is being extracted and and whatever you know everything is extracted from us no then we are doing also some kind of labor we can start with immaterial labor or or even emotional labor or we even now when, I, when we are breathing or doing whatever, we are doing some kind of labor that is kind of creating, again, resource or creating content or whatever. And then at the end, we are also sold as a product. So it's this kind of new for me. I think this change is a really crucial, this kind of that we are playing all roles in this like magic triangle be between resource labor and the product. Seven. Shadows and capture agents. This is my favorite one. 
The spectacle of a constant flow of information projected through the interface creates a digital shadow on the opposite wall of the cave. The projected digital shadow on the wall is a resource field where thousands of capture agents, tentacles of the rhizomatic surveillance complex, extract information. Every movement or emotional reaction is being recorded continuously. These capture agents can take many forms and sizes. From the tiny pieces of code, crawlers that wander the web, over the sensors catching heartbeats and surveillance cameras capturing our faces, to the complex network of satellites orbiting Earth. They can see our shadows through a full range of the electromagnetic spectrum. They can be invisible or massive like a 500 meters wide radio telescope. The process of quantification is reaching into the human affective, cognitive and physical worlds. Every segment of our existence reflected on our digital shadows, can be seen as a form of direct or indirect labor producing data as a behavioral surplus. When we breathe, walk, or sleep, every single emotion that we feel, our attention, our body temperature, or diseases that we have, everything can produce a behavioral surplus if being captured by surveillance apparatus. In that sense, even our bare existence within the walls of the cave can be seen as labor. Prisoner workers need to spend more and more hours maintaining their profiles in a similar fashion to sex workers in the windows of red light districts. Digital identity labor is the forced labor of the 21st century. This creates an auto-disciplinary society where each anomaly and misbehavior is detected and quantified. Okay, the shadow. Shadow on the wall. So on one side we have a device and there, there is this light out going out from this device, but then this light is creating the shadow on the back of this cave. And, uh, uh, and in this shadow it's really important to, to, to understand so this is this position of us as a resource. This is our digital footprint that is being then like uh, completely like extracted. And, and, and so you can think about like thousands and thousands of, of different companies that have millions and millions of different sensors and different ways how to extract data, how to extract information out of this shadow. If we start from this idea of immaterial labor in which we needed to create the blog and then we were thinking like, okay, then you have like, you know, you are making comments and then you think, okay, when we are making comments on Facebook, we are working for Facebook and so on. But now it's going deeper and deeper and deeper. It's going deeper in a way that we don't need to do anything anymore because we are constantly being, our shadows are constantly being extracted. So every breath, every, you know, our our like uh, blood pressure, our uh, oxygen percentage of oxygen in our blood or, or our movement or when we wake up. So each segment of our life, how we smile, when we smile, how long we are see, looking into something. So it's this kind of attention economy. You can also track this, like how many names you have for different things. You have attention economy, you have like emotion economy, you have many new forms of economy. That means that they are, each economy is basically new forms of, of resource, new forms of labor. So at the end, we don't need to do anything. Our bare existence is a, a, a form of labor now in this cave, because we are constantly being uh, observed. 8. Platoptican. The gravity of these techno giants hold billions of users, workers, products at the bottom of those caves. In this assemblage of allegories, millions of caves or prison cells form the unique and invisible panopticon structure. The central tower of this structure has two main functions, one, to project the content on the walls of the caves and, two, to surveil and capture the digital shadows of the prisoners reflected on the opposite wall. So this one is a classic, and I don't want to speak about this, like how wonderful this, uh, you know, architecture in which you don't need even to have anyone in the middle and so on. So, but what I really like here, it's also like really related to our existence in in the cave. It's that we don't see the other caves. We are just like seeing the projections, and then then in in that sense, this tower in the in the in the middle, it also have like now dual function. It's also projector. So this, this, this tower, it's projecting the content on the wall, but also like sucking all the information out of our shadows. 9. Information Retrieval 
From each cell cave and through the core of the Panopticon Tower, streams of information are flowing into one of the central structures of this image, the data bank. The data bank is not just the engine room, but the power itself. From here, we are examining three processes crucial for this story. On one side, extracted, stored and analyzed personal data, is shaping the multidimensional portrait of the individual. On the second, all the products of the user's labor are being stored, analyzed and ranked, to form the information spectacle of images, meanings, and reputations. Furthermore, in the third one, this structure lies upon the top of the exploitation of human minds, bodies and nature. 10. Creation of Data Body Our online behavior is captured, processed, and deconstructed into statistical vectors, clusters, patterns and anomalies. Each move we make is carefully analyzed by thousands of mathematical functions, algorithms and machine learning systems. This system, does not see us through linear narratives emerging from our browsing behavior, metadata, or movements in physical space but as n-dimensional statistical projections. Each and every one of our clicks sharpens the resolution and complexity of this abstract and constantly changing statistical portrait or data body. So this n-dimensional uh, uh, statistical space is super important for me and, and I, I dedicated some time in making, uh, uh, you know, like for example, this map, uh, it's called Inside Facebook Algorithmic Factory. It's kind of like the, the, the explanation of, of, of this part that, that, that were like played here. So, so in a way, what, what was the key, super interesting for me here, we spend like, you know, a year or two just to map all the data that is coming into, into into this factory and then you can try to think about each type of data as a one dimension of this multi-dimensional portrait that they are building out of us and uh, and uh, the the thing is like for us it's kind of hard to think about like more dimensions than five or three or whatever but but when we think about in in, in like ai and, and and data analysis this is completely normal and each signal about like our you know, parts of this, this, this shadow, coming out of the shadow, it's like one dimension of, of this picture. And, and what is like super in, uh, interesting in, in this sense, all of those information together are cre creating a new territory. And, and this is, for example, in case of Facebook, you have this social graph that is the heart of, of, of this machine, of this like system, in a sense of like now all of those bits of data, each of those bits of data, it's one point in some kind of new territory, in some kind of new map. And all of them are connected with different kinds of links that have a different meanings, but they, they constitute one new territory. So this is some kind of second, layer, se second level territory. So the first territory, it's our shadow, you know, that is being extracted. The second level uh, territory, there it's now all of those information forming a new space, new new form of, of, of resource, like one, one territory that is now being, being uh, uh, extracted. And how this territory is being extracted? By thousands and thousands of different mathematical functions, statistical functions, AI, that are basically crawling now over this territory and trying to, to, to extract pieces of information and to create new value to create some kind of n-dimensional statistical spaces in which we are kind of mixed with other people creating relation between us objects events places and, and everything 11 individuals these multi-dimensional data portraits of the individual consisting of millions of data points in hundreds of dimensions can be seen as what deleuze will name individual a physically embodied human subject that is endlessly divisible and reducible to data representations via the modern technologies of control. The critical art ensemble is describing this data body as the fascist sibling of the virtual body, a much more highly developed virtual form, and one that exists in complete service to the corporate and police state. 12. Condividuals? Individual is always open to interaction, always ready to be detached from, and attached to, 
other individuals that share some properties with it, creating collective agents as condividuals, or supersubjects. The mountains and valleys of multidimensional ever-changing invisible algorithmic landscapes are clustering individual individuals and creating new relations, taxonomies, and ontologies. So if we are in, in, in kind of like now this, our individual being or whatever it is, I really love to think about all of those like different algorithmic uh, uh, landscapes in which you have a valleys and, and mountains of this landscape and, and our bubbles are, are basically there within this landscape and falling into different kinds of, you know, joining together and, and creating some kind of new individual uh, individuals as, as Matteo Pasquinelli explained in, in a way like now we are forming some kind of really uh, 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 strange uh, 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 overlapping between our bodies, our locations in some kind of statistical space. 13. Surveillant Assemblage The full picture of our individual being is not centralized in one place but is spread across hundreds of data centers in the rhizomatic assemblage of the surveillance economy and government actors. This non-heterogeneous and dispersed assemblage portrait exists through the system of data dealers, the official and unofficial exchange of data, in constant flow forming one functional entity. 14. Content Extraction Each web page or other piece of content that is being captured in the wild is rendered and analyzed. This content is being extracted into hundreds of different signals. Collected content and extracted data become a permanent corporate resource for creating multidimensional, dynamic, complex topologies in which every piece of data becomes an object that is contextually linked to other objects. On one side, this is like those two, two different sides of this, this process. On one side is this creation of data body. It's like who we are, what we like, or what we do. You know? On the other side, it's like huge collection of everything that we create. Everything that, that is created is being like quantified and, and, and stored in, you know, Google quantified all the books like on the world. All the every word that is ever written, it's, it's part of this like huge collection of, of content and, and things and, and everything. So in, in one moment, uh, uh, you have like, you know, this stream of, of our digital, you know, representation as a data body. It's kind of mixing with this and two of them are creating this kind of our bubble of information, creating this reality show that is being presented on our walls of our cave. Within this map, this new meta-territory, crawl hundreds of different mathematical functions, algorithms, and neural networks that we can call instruments of measurement and perception. 15. Instruments of measurement and perception. Those instruments of measurement and perception always come with inbuilt aberrations. The shape of the algorithmic lenses is carefully crafted to project the image that is in accordance with the platform's financial interest and political goals and values. Platforms often imply direct rules and regulations. They have direct power of regulation of what can be seen or said, what kind of content can and cannot exist in their universe. Here we are visually representing those rules and regulations as filters. Similarly to the algorithmic lenses, the fabric of those filters is crafted according to the platform's financial interests and political goals and values. So this process, this uh, chapter, it's speaking about this process that is, com of course, not neutral. And, and this is like this one person going around and basically shaping this filter in the way he, he wants to. And this like person hanging on this uh, lens is basically some kind of bias, human bias that is like moving those lenses and creating different pictures. So uh, the, if we go back to this like picture of Facebook algorithmic factory, you know, even them, they don't know how these things really work and what are the effects. But the effects of this are being fine-tuned in, in towards like creating more capital, it's, they are not fine tuned to be some kind of perfect, you know, like uh, help to humanity or, or any kind of thing. So the, this is this, in a way, we should always understand that that each of those things that even looks like a machines, there are always people there who are shaping those those processes and those machines in a way to to for their own uh, goals. Sixteen. Projection of the world. 
Instruments of measurement and perception are ranking and defining hierarchies and relations between content, users and meaning. They define the digital regime of truth and order. This regime is a prism through which the world is projected in the form of the constant stream of spectacles on the walls of the caves. 17. Engines of Extraction Empowered by the digital extractivism tools of the information age, everything becomes a potential frontier for expansion and extraction. From the depth of DNA code in every single cell of the human organism, to vast frontiers of human emotions, behavior and social relations, to nature as a whole, everything becomes the territory for the new extractivism. At this moment in the 21st century, we see a new form of extractivism that is well underway, one that reaches into the furthest corners of the biosphere and the deepest layers of human cognitive and effective being. 18. Enclosure and Affinity to Infinity In the transition to the information age, capitalism was given a chance to satisfy its affinity for infinity, to form and conquer an infinite number of new territories, to create new mechanisms for the accumulation of capital within these new spaces and to formulate new forms of exploitation. Once the territory is invaded, the process of enclosure and exploitation is established. Every time when, when they find a new way to extract some type of data, like for example when Google um, get into their hands like all the, the scans of like uh, cancer patients and, 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 and run some kind of like AI to learn how to recognize, you know, different types of cancers, that, that's a form of enclosure, you know, even, even that sounds really good and it benefit us, it's an enclosure in which like they now have a product, they now have, have a, a tool that they will uh, commodify and use for different means. So that means each type of data, each, each new type of territory that is being conquered, it's being basically then uh, um, enclosed and, 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 and privatized in a sense. New forms of extractivism are expanding into the territories far behind the biodiversity and knowledge enclosure. This is why we are not speaking anymore just about the knowledge economy but about the attention economy, emotion economy, and many other new economies being born from the invasion of new territories of extraction. 19. Fractal Supply Chains Supply chains hidden behind the engines of extractivism are black boxes as much as neural networks or algorithms hidden behind interfaces. Each triangle of this fractal represents one phase in the production process, from birth in a geological process, through life as a consumer product, and ultimately to death in an electronics dump. Within the fractal supply chain, we see a perpetual dance between human labor, non-human labor, earth labor and automatization. 20. Blood, Sweat, and Toxic Lakes Every click or swipe we make online creates one little hole in the ground, filled with toxic waste and covered by toxic clouds. Every movement of materials and data within the planetary scale factory has its own hidden price. Supply chains are optimized towards maximizing profit for a few, while the real costs of the destruction that follows are shared among all the living entities on the planet in the present and the future. One molecule after another is extracted by labor and technique to make things for humans, but the waste products don't return so that the cycle can renew itself. So this, this segment was like really deeply you know, explored in this map that it's called Anatomy of an AI System. And we tried to, to understand like how this supply chain, try to understand basically digital labor in the widest possible way. So to start from the, the mines in Congo or in a lithium mine in Serbia and to finish up in your room. This is this like third, let's say, segment of extractivism. It's not just this kind of new fancy ways of extracting data, extracting human labor, immaterial labor and so on. It's also like based on like traditional uh, uh, extractivism of like extracting materials, minerals and, 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 and basically different forms of, of, of hundreds and, and hundreds of different forms of labor that it's sometimes called ghost labor because we don't, don't want to think about that. We don't, when we are pressing our phones and doing stuff, we don't have this perception of either 
uh, uh, energy consumption, either ecological, either like labor that is being being like put into those uh, devices, and and in a way the the three quarter of of like a, a CO2 footprint of of devices are being basically creating through doing creation of of those uh, devices. Twenty one triangular trade. Slavery was at the heart of the development of the modern planetary scale global economy. From those days, the same model of constant flow within the vast fractal production chains expanded in time, space and complexity. The transatlantic slave trade evolved into the contemporary planetary scale factory. 22. Chains of Digital Colonialism Traditional colonial practices of control over critical assets, trade routes, natural resources and exploitation of human labor are still deeply embedded in the contemporary supply chains, logistics and assembly lines of digital content, products and infrastructure. In that sense, chains of digital colonialism are made both on the extraction of digital surplus and the traditional exploitation of labor and resources. The concepts presented are mostly represented here visually, in the form of allegories. Dictionaries define allegory as a story, poem, or picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning, typically a moral or political one. All of these allegories and concepts together, joined in the form of an assemblage, create together a blueprint of a machine-like superstructure, or a super-allegory. In that sense, what we have here is an almost fractal allegorical structure, an allegory, within an allegory, within an allegory. It's a my attempt, and, and it really didn't meant into like, you know, you know, creating some kind of big theory about everything. This is mostly some kind of assemblage of already existing things that I kind of like put some kind of salt of craziness on this and, and, and try to see this as a, some kind of one uh, uh, one big picture and in a way it's my this map it's kind of it's really close to my heart in a sense because it's like my my take on this and I, I completely understand that like those attempts are you know uh, you know they're going to fail in a sense on so many levels but this is my attempt to to create some kind of big picture and maybe to to try to visualize those processes and those concepts of uh, uh, that I was able to to find and to to think about, and I think like visualizing uh, 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 those concepts and and mega structures, even they're completely this one, it's completely on some kind of like really high level of abstraction. I think it's important that we try to find the new ways to 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 understand this rea reality and to understand complexity and to understand new forms of extraction and new forms of labor and to try to finally understand the factory, to try finally to understand how come we finish in this situation in which like we have such a huge, you know, like concentration of power and wealth in few different companies and how this idea, beautiful idea of internet as an open decentralized mantra, whatever it is, turn into, into this kind of like a machinery of exploitation. And uh, so this is my take on this, and, and I, let, let, let's look like at the lines. There is one uh, joke here. Okay. Starring, so those are the stars. German flag. So, <laughs> thank you. I, 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 um, I, it was tough, no? <laughs> yeah.